Well, it's 7.02 uh, and why don't we get started? I wanna welcome everyone to our Smilo Patient Family Forum. As many of you know, this has been an event that we have been holding electronically through Zoom really since the beginning of the pandemic uh, early last year. And we, we do this really because we know that um, people wanna be informed and, uh, and know what's going on. And it is our goal at Smilo Cancer Hospital and Yale Cancer Center to keep our patients and our families informed and know what we're doing to address this public health crisis, what we're doing to ensure that the care of patients is attended to with the same attention we do always, and also how we do it in a way that keeps you and all our staff safe. Um, this has been obviously a very challenging time for all of us, and we really appreciate uh, everything you're doing to work with us on this. And, uh, and obviously we are here to answer your questions. I'm fortunately today joined by a number of our leaders at our cancer hospital and our health system. And I'll just call out their names and ask them to uh, just wave so we know who they are. So joined today by uh, Kim Slusser, who is vice president for patient services and our chief nursing officer for Smilo Cancer Hospital. Dr. Kevin Billingsley, who is our chief medical officer and a professor of surgery at Yale. Uh, Dr. Om Despondi, who is the executive director of clinical operations for Yale New Haven Health System. Uh, Dr. Karen Adelson, who is the chief quality officer and deputy chief medical officer for Smilo and uh, medical oncologist in the breast program. And uh, Dr. Tara Samp, who is the chief patient experience officer and as well a medical oncologist in our breast program. And our goal today is, is really to share updates uh, to discuss the, the opportunities of vaccinations, uh, as well as uh, with Dr. Samsoff, also think about uh, what we can do uh, in terms of the well being of our patients. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show a few slides. This, this is showing up, yes? Good. So um, the agenda is uh, first, we'll hear some updates from Kim Slusser and Kevin Billingsley about what's going on at Smilo during all this time. Dr. Despondi will uh, share with us information about the vaccine and the planning that the health system is doing for our patients. As well, Dr. Adelson, who is uh, our chief quality officer, as I mentioned, has been working with the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network, uh, which is a consortium of National Cancer Institute designated cancer centers of which we are one and we are the Cancer Center for Connecticut to address how we uh, work through vaccinations for cancer patients. And then finally, as I mentioned, Dr. Sam is gonna talk to all of us about how we support each other and maintain wellness through these very challenging times. You know, from the, the very start, and I know I speak for everyone in the uh, in Smilo Cancer Hospital and Yale Cancer Center. Um, we uh, work uh, assiduously to address this crisis and to sort of keep uh, our patients uh, it, getting the care they need. Um, and so the principles we laid out when this crisis began in February and March of last year was to absolutely remain steadfast to the care of our patients, continuing compassionate expert care for all of our cancer patients, to ensure the safety of cancer patients, recognizing that cancer patients are a vulnerable population with respect to this virus, to protect our staff, uh, and also to engage our research community to help us come up with ways to combat this virus. And I wanna say on this last point, uh, I'm just so proud of all of our researchers, scientists, people working in population science who have beyond continuing the important work of cancer prevention and therapy have also uh, put considerable time into defining uh, a better understanding of this virus and how we ultimately 
beat it. So it's been a challenging year. Uh, and I think we're all excited and anticipating the rollout of vaccines. Um, the development of a vaccine in the course of 2020 is frankly unprecedented in the health de you know, developments of medicinal chemistry and health and drug development um, in, the, in the world. And we're just so pleased to actually have these things now. Um, and I wanna just uh, share with you some background because we have a lot of questions and my, and my colleagues on the panel will answer questions, but just wanna review what we know about these vaccines. Now, there are two, two vaccines, RNA vaccines that are now approved and in practice, one manufactured by Pfizer, the other one by Moderna, which I'm sure you've heard of. How does that work? Well, there are RNA vaccines. RNA is part of sort of the approach, uh, the building blocks of our cells that encode proteins. They're short lived. RNA is not a permanent lasting molecule. It's a molecule that actually only exists temporarily, encodes a protein for cells. And what uh, the scientists at Pfizer and Moderna did is they figured out a way to put that piece of RNA and this RNA encodes a, the spike protein uh, on the COVID-19, put that RNA into a, a lipid or fat particle, um, then put that into the context of a vaccine, which gets injected into your upper arm. And upon that, that lipid particle then enters into our cells where that RNA can then make the protein, specifically the spike protein. To be clear, it is not the virus. It is not capable of causing a viral reaction, but it simply elicits that one protein. And what does that, the presence of that protein do temporarily? Is it prompts an immune response, both the making of antibodies that fight infection as well as other immune cells that fight infection. And by virtue of having that, you then develop an immunity towards the virus so that if you were to be exposed in principle, your body would be able to fight off that infection, fight off the virus and frankly prevent an infection. And that is the theory behind it. To be clear, people ask, well, RNA, that sounds like genetic code. Am I at risk at that? No. The RNA is actually destroyed relatively quickly over time after the injection. So it doesn't last in your body. There's no alteration to your DNA or genetic code by virtue of this injection. Um, a second uh, vaccine is under development and we anticipate that that vaccine will likely have data from its clinical trial in several weeks manufactured by Johnson & Johnson. That vaccine is a more classical vaccine design. What do they do? They actually take that same spike protein gene, but they put it into a virus, but a virus that is not harmful to humans. It's, it's basically an inert, an inert virus, a virus that can't replicate, it can't reproduce, but it carries that spike protein. And by virtue, again, of being injected in your arm, that virus then inserts the spike protein gene into your cell, which is again, only a temporary situation where it too will produce proteins on the surface that elicit antibodies and immune response, and in theory will give you the same protection. As you, many of you may know, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines require two injections, three to four weeks apart. The Johnson & Johnson design is only one injection. But to be clear, as I'll show in a moment, we have data from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. We don't yet have data from Johnson & Johnson. That we await at some point in February. And I just wanna show the exciting results. Both the Pfizer and Moderna RNA vaccines have a similar result. And this was the Pfizer vaccine was a study of approximately 40,000 individuals who were tested, half of whom got the vaccine. In this case, it's known as BNT162B2 or a placebo, just salt water injection. And what we're looking at here is 
the likelihood of developing infection uh, up here on the y-axis and time since that first injection here on the horizontal axis. And as you can see in the blue, the people who got the placebo did have development of a COVID-19 infection over time. But in contrast, you'll see there's a slight uptick in the people who got the vaccine. But by day 12, this is blowing up this little section of the graph, it's flat. There really are no new, in, no new infections, meaning there's a profound protection between this blue line and this red line. And if you look more at the statistical results, you can see several findings, namely for those people who were more than seven days after the second dose of the vaccine, 95% protection. Meaning that if you compare the rate of infection for the people who had placebo versus those who got the vaccine, there's a 95% reduction. Now to be clear, we were hoping that the reduction would be 60 or 70%. This is far beyond our expectations and, and really impressive. One other statistic that you'll hear about is what was the protection, not after the two doses, but after just the first dose. And you'll see it here, it was about 52% were protected just after the first dose. Does that mean you should only get one dose? I don't think so. You want 95% protection. And we anticipate that once getting committed to getting either the Pfizer or Moderna, uh, that you'll, you will get the second dose, that dose will be available to you. You'll be encouraged to get it and 95% protection is really incredible. Um, we, um, I just wanna be clear, we have a number of questions that have already been submitted online. Um, among the questions that actually have come in is, is this being recorded? The answer is, if I'm not mistaken, Renee, it is, and will be placed online so that for those individuals that you know that wanna see this and could make it this evening, they will be able to view it online. Another question that other questions have come in and we can take during the question and answer se section is safety of the vaccine. And frankly, the safety appears to be uh, quite excellent. Um, in terms of long-term concerns, well, uh, it's still early, but we don't see any long-term safety issues. There are people after the second dose who do get what may seem like a bit of a flu-like feeling 24 hours after getting the shot. It's, it's typically transient. You're not going, you're not getting the infection. You cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine. It's just an immune response and a robust immune response where about 20% of people who get the Pfizer vaccine can get a flu-like uh, a flu-like feeling. About 40% of the people who get Moderna can get a flu-like feeling, but usually gone after 24 to 36 hours. And people can take Tylenol for that. Um, another uh, question that arises is, well, it, once I get vaccinated, does that mean I can go about my business? And the answer is only in the context of what we need to be doing with COVID-19. So you still need to wear a mask, you still need to physically distance, and you still need to be careful. Because until our public health authorities tell us that it's time to go back to normal, we all need to be very careful. It will be reassured getting the vaccine, but we still want to be careful because one thing we don't know, we know that getting the vaccine does protect you, but does it prevent you from transmitting the virus? That is, you can get the vaccine, you might have actually been exposed to it, you may feel fine, but you may harbor it briefly and transmit it. So almost an asymptomatic infection. That's a good thing for the person who got the vaccine, but you don't want to put other people at risk. So you got to wear a mask, even after you get the vaccine. Um, we'll have a lot more time for questions. Let me turn over now to my colleagues, Kim Slusser and Kevin Billingsley, for updates on what's going on in Smilo. Hi, Charlie. Thank you uh, for the opportunity part of this forum. I also want to say thank you to all of those that have joined us this evening. It, it's just wonderful to see so many people uh, here with us. 
The past few weeks have been an exciting time, as Charlie has mentioned, as our teams have been receiving their vaccine and doing our part is what Yale New Haven Health System calls crushing COVID. Um, we have had such a great response from our SMILO staff. Close to 73% of our SMILO staff specifically have received their first dose of the vaccine with many already receiving their second dose. I'm really glad we're having this forum this evening as I know that our patients have been calling their care teams wanting to know more about the vaccine and we are fortunate to have Dr. Shishande and Adelson here with us to share information with you. I also want to take an opportunity to thank our community for those patients that received and completed a survey that was sent out recently. We wanted to get our patients opinions on what they value in regards to timeliness and availability of appointments what you really, what you may want offered in telehealth cancer care services, and if you would like to take advantage of untraditional hours of operations. We've learned a lot through COVID and we've developed many of these uh, initiatives to keep caring for our cancer patients through the pandemic. And we wanted to get our patients opinion about are these, are these sustainable um, opportunities for us in delivering your care. We sent out this survey to thousands of our patients and received responses from nearly 700 individuals, which is actually a wonderful response. While we are still going through all of the feedback, I wanted to thank our Smilo community for completing the survey as it truly helps us in our journey to transform care in a way that matters to you and your loved ones. There have also been a lot of questions regarding what we are still doing to keep our patients and staff safe as we are now in this new stage in the pandemic with the rollout of the vaccine. At this point, as Charlie mentioned, we continue with all our pre-appointment and pre-admission screenings and follow all our state and CDC guidelines. We are still either through my charter calling, screening for exposure to COVID prior to your appointment. We are still maintaining our screenings at the front door of our facilities and wearing our masks. Our staff continue to self-monitor their temperature and for other signs of COVID twice a day. As I turn it over to Kevin, I wanna thank everyone again for spending the evening with us and trusting us with your care. Kevin. Thank you, Kim. I'd also like to sound, sound my note of gratitude for the trust that you all and your families uh, place in us here at Smilo and at the Yale Cancer Center for providing your cancer care. We um, are relentlessly committed to your ongoing safety, both in your cancer care, as well as in shepherding your care through this period of a pandemic. I think one of the things that I, I would like to share with the audience is that one of the things that we are continuing to do, which is, which is difficult, but we believe there are sound reasons uh, to support it for patient safety, is that we have continued to hold fairly restrictive policies around patient visitors. And that limits the number of people who actually come into the hospitals, hospital, and it makes it difficult for our patients who are getting inpatient cancer care. As a surgical oncologist, I have a number of patients who are in the hospital, sometimes for several days at a time. And I can assure the audience that both myself, as well as all of our surgical teams and the other clinical teams providing inpatient care are going the extra mile to keep in touch with families and loved ones at home so that you are hearing directly from us, even though you are not seeing us in the hospital making rounds as we usually do. Uh, we're also working hard to make sure that all patients have some support with using technology, phones, iPads, other devices to help keep in touch with family. One of the things that I do encourage my patients and all patients and families coming into the Center for Care and the outpatient arena to do is if you do not have a support person or loved one with you, really use your phone, use, a, use an iPad, use a tablet, get someone on the phone with you so that you have the benefit of another set of ears listening to that clinical encounter. We are completely supportive of that. We've adapted our practice style to embrace this. And um, I think that this has actually been one of the great learnings that has come out of the pandemic is that we are all increasingly comfortable with using these technology interfaces to help create 
a sense of family um, engagement in these clinical encounters. Just uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit, I want to share with the audience that although we have continued to have some operational changes uh, in our in our care here at Smilo, some of our services are in uh, altered locations. It has been possible for us to proceed with all of our clinical care at at really uh, full pace. Um, we're functioning on the inpatient arena, uh, giving inpatient treatments, bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant, cell therapy, as well as complex surgical care at all of our at our main hospital and delivery network hospitals at full speed, as uh, we continue to do in our infusion units and outpatient treatment areas, including our multiple sites of radiation oncology. Um, so with that, I would also urge people to remember that cancer is not the only um, threatening health problem that we face, and you are safe to, uh, to pursue your, your background medical care. Please do not uh, put off routine medical care, follow up with your primary care physician for any concerning symptoms, try to maintain your scheduled visits, and of course, if you have scheduled screening exams uh, for, for uh, a cancer, please do everything you can to follow up with those. Um, while we do have some delays in things like screening mammography, we are working as quickly as we can through that backlog. And that is an important part of the service we deliver and we look forward to providing that for you. So thank you. Uh, Kim and Kevin, thank you for those updates. So let me turn now uh, to Dr. Om Deshpande, um, who uh, is here to share uh, updates on vaccination and planning through the El New Haven Health System. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you all for, uh, for being here. Uh, I'll just share a couple of slides to frame the conversation here. Uh, so this is just a uh, this is just a basic timeline of where uh, of how vaccinations have uh, transpired here at El New Haven Health. Just for some context, as uh, as illustrated at the top, the uh, initial approval by the FDA for Pfizer took place on the 11th. Uh, we actually started, uh, consistent with the public health guidelines, to vaccinate our healthcare workers uh, a short five days later. Um, immediately thereafter, on the 18th, uh, the Moderna vaccine was approved, and uh, we have been using both of those vaccines in our vaccination programs thus far. Um, so we have, you know, initially focused, again, uh, based on the guidance given to us from the state on vaccinating our healthcare workers. And we have some, uh, about 34,000 individuals in the health system, which includes our medical staff, um, who are eligible for uh, vaccination as a part of our healthcare work, uh, workforce. Uh, we've been fairly successful. We've, as of today, we're at around 68% of our healthcare workers are vaccinated. Our goal is to get to 80 um, and we are on our way and we are continuing to press forward in getting to that goal. Um, in, at the beginning of January, we started well, actually towards the end of December, we started planning on how we would really pivot to vaccinate the general public. Um, it's a critical part of our mission uh, in serving the communities to uh, support and, and provide vaccination. And we have done so in a way that is scalable and uh, can get very big indeed, as uh, depending on the amount of vaccine we, uh, we, we uh, receive. So we initially piloted uh, vaccination of the general public at uh, several of our Northeast Medical Group ambulatory sites. And on the 22nd of January, we started uh, putting up some of our mass vaccination sites, uh, which are and now we currently have uh, five uh, sites up and the specific locations are, are listed in the, in the bottom left. So in, Granite, in the Granite area, it's the Brunswick School. In the Bridgeport Milford uh, area, it's currently the Parsons Center in Milford. In New Haven, we have three sites, the Floyd Little Athletic Center uh, in the heart of New Haven, uh, the, West, the Yale West Campus, which is in West Haven, and the Landman Center, which is attached to the Payne Whitney Gym, also in the heart of New Haven. And in the New London region, we have uh, Mitchell College as our, uh, our most recent mass vaccination site. In addition to that, we do have uh, a limited quantity of vaccine, limited amount of vaccination uh, available at the six Northeast Medical Group ambulatory sites listed in the middle. 
And as we look forward, um, we are very, we plan on putting up a, site, a mass vaccination site at the University of Bridgeport, uh, Mohegan Sun and other places um, as, as we go forward. Um, so a couple of points just around healthcare worker testing. The reason that we continue to focus on this is that, you know, consistent with what Charlie and the rest of the group have discussed on many of these town halls, our commitment is to, uh, is to continue to provide the highest quality care for our patients in the safest way possible. So we, uh, in addition to the typical uh, public health interventions, wearing masks, hand hygiene, social distancing, we now have a fourth and extremely effective intervention in vaccines. So that is all the reason we have focused and we continue to focus on healthcare workers is that we want to keep our patients safe and to make sure that our locations, uh, especially for cancer patients, um, but for all of our patients are as safe as, as humanly possible. Um, the other piece is that we want to make sure that we can continue to provide superlative care uh, without any interruption. And uh, as you know, healthcare workers have been uh, at higher risk associated with COVID and um, you know, that can take them out of work. So vaccination is a key piece of, of preserving our workforce, of, pr pr of protecting our, work our healthcare workers, and by extension, continuing to provide uh, care uh, regardless of how, um, how intense the pandemic continues to be. In terms of, uh, I'll just go to the next slide just to illustrate where we are uh, here at Hale New Haven Health. And there are a couple of things I wanna draw your attention to. Uh, these data are a few days old now, I think it's as of the 24th, um, but nationally uh, about four, just over 4 million, 41 million doses have been distributed, but only around 21 million, and this is probably a little higher now, maybe in the 25 or 26 range, uh, have actually been administered into individuals. So that's a national utilization of the mid 50% range. Um, obviously there's been a ton reported in the press about this and that's not, this is not the speed that anyone feels is, uh, is where we, what we would want. Uh, Connecticut, as, as you are also probably aware, uh, has been doing better. And the utilization rate is in the mid 60s, which is uh, something I think all of us should be uh, proud of. And uh, at the top right is Yale New Haven Health. So as you can see, we've, um, again, these, dose, these numbers, at, uh, the 59 or 60,000 are a few days old, so it's higher now. But uh, the most important uh, number is that 92% utilization. What that tells us is when we get the vaccine, uh, we get it into people. And 92% of all of our doses are used up and administered on a weekly basis. And that remaining 8% is, you know, some of that we just keep in it as a buffer. And some of that just, it really fluctuates a few percentage points depending on which time point in the week you look at it uh, because we get the, the vaccine shipment once a week. So that 92% um, number tells you that we have figured out the operational need, the issues that are needed to uh, deliver these vaccines into people uh, as quickly as possible. We are ready to take care of everyone. Uh, we are ready to vaccinate. And the only thing we are really waiting on is, is vaccines, uh, and which, I'll, which I'll touch upon uh, in a moment. Um, the bottom graph really just shows the trajectory um, the, the appointments by day and uh, the breakdown between Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, thus far, the bulk of our uh, vaccine doses uh, administered have been Moderna. Uh, going forward, it will be primarily Pfizer. Um, but you know, from a, from a practical purpose, it doesn't really matter which one it is. Uh, the, the point is that we are vaccinating people effectively. And as of today, actually, the total doses given is, uh, in the, is at the 55,000 55, range. So um, what I want you to take away from that, I think, is, uh, I'll just stop sharing, is that number one, we're following the public health guidance as, uh, as laid forth by the state of Connecticut. Currently, the, those individuals who are eligible other than healthcare workers are people who, who are 75 and over. Um, so we currently have a number of sites open. Uh, what we don't currently have, uh, what's sort of our challenge right now is that we just we don't have, our schedules are not as open as we would like them to be. And the reason is that we haven't been getting enough vaccine. So this week is sort of one of our big weeks. We are, we are vaccinating 12,000 people this week. Uh, we've been able to, we vaccinated 3,500 people in one day earlier this week. And if you, you've seen some press about the sites, if you go to the sites, you see that um, there are a lot more, there's a huge amount of capacity. So we are, we are all set up, we have the staff, we know the model, 
Um, and as soon as we get the vaccine, we are, we are, we are ready to scale up um, at a moment's notice. Um, so as I mentioned, first, uh, right now we're vaccinating individuals who are 75 and over. We expect the state of Connecticut to drop that to the people who are 65 and over, probably in the middle of February. What we don't currently know is exactly uh, where the where individuals with uh, chronic conditions or conditions that place them at elevated risk when they become eligible. We know that they are they are going to be eligible well before you know the average healthy person with no clinical issues, but we are still waiting for that guidance. So that's just something that we don't know. But I think again, the message should be rest assured that when we are able to, and we have the vaccine, we will uh, we are ready and we are ready to. Uh, to meet that need and uh, provide the vaccine as quickly as possible. Um, a few other questions, you know, people have asked, you know, can I get, will I be able to get it at my Smilo Care Center? Um, I think my answer would be, I hope so. Uh, in the meantime, the, you know, as Charlie mentioned, they, these are the two vaccines we currently have are mRNA vaccines and they need to be kept extremely cold. Um, and it's, it's logistically difficult to distribute and, and keep them you know, in all the places in the system. So right now we are really focusing on keeping it to a limited number of locations. I think as we get more vaccine, we figure out the operational issues, we would like to increase that availability. And I think especially when the AstraZeneca and the, and the more importantly, I think the J&J &J vaccine uh, become available, that's something that will be much easier to stock and distribute and administer in all of our ambulatory sites. Um, so uh, I'll stop there. I can, I'm happy to take some questions. I'll keep answering. I'll look at the Q and A's and answer there, but uh, thank you for having me. Um, just rest, be rest assured that we are keeping our care areas as safe as possible. And we are, uh, we are eager to provide the vaccine to you. Well, Om, thank you. And uh, really congratulations to you and your entire team uh, in really setting the, the model of, of rollout. Because uh, I, what I certainly heard, and I hope everyone on this call has heard, is that the only thing that is in your way is just getting supply. And the fact that you can get 92% plus of the doses into people's arms quickly really just speaks to the fact that you've set up systems that once we get the supply up, uh, you're going you're gonna to get it to our patients. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, we're going to open it up to sort of questions at the end, but let me just, uh, before I turn to the next speaker, let me just uh, offer up one question I'm seeing a lot of is, do you have a sense of supply chain and how that's going to look over the coming weeks and months? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's the right question. Um, I, so as I said, we have a, a fair amount. It's, this week is a big week. Next week, we uh, expect to vaccinate probably between five and 7,000 Again, you know, that's not where we want to be. We're building this model to be able to vaccinate 40,000 um, 40, or more individuals on a weekly basis. So we have a pretty scalable model. Um, the issue is um, that I think in the next month, it's, the supply is going to be a little constrained. One thing pe people have probably heard that, uh, you know, with the transition of the new administration, there is a lack of transparency, uh, even at the federal level, about where the doses are and how many they actually have on hand and how to distribute them. We are all optimistic about the fact that in the next 10 days, the administration will be able to make those links, understand where things are, and really put the federal government back on the footing where it should be such that those, that those doses get distributed out uh, in a more effective and uh, effective way in a, in a higher number. So I think that you know next week it will be okay. The week after, I think the, probably the two weeks after that are probably going to be the low water mark in terms of how many doses we receive. Probably on the order of four to five thousand. Um, but I think we are all optimistic that after that uh, we will get number one the transparency and early warning about uh, when the numbers that we will get, such that we can plan, and then we'll also we'll actually see more doses actually come to us. So I think that by the Probably the third week of February, things are going to ease up substantially, uh, but the you know the next two to three weeks are going to be a little tight uh, on our end in terms of the availability. I will say that we are opening schedules fairly regularly, so if you you know if you are over 70, the age of 75 and are eligible as, as such, I encourage you to check back on the website at, uh, you know periodically because uh, availability does become open, uh, although the demand does uh, the demand's pretty high, so it goes pretty quickly. But we're, we we 
we open schedules on an ongoing basis. So if you don't see it initially, come back again and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have something for you. Oh, thank you. And I, I, there's, a, by the way, I, I, we're definitely getting your questions online and even before, and we will come to it, but I do want to also allow our other speakers to uh, share their thoughts and then we'll, we'll open it up to the entire panel. Entire panel. So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Karen Adelson is our chief quality officer and actually has been participating in a guideline group that the National Cancer Institute uh, Cancer Centers have been working on for guidelines for cancer patients with respect to the vaccine. And Karen has been uh, gracious to join us tonight to share the results of that work. So Karen, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Charlie. Um, I just want to say for all of us who work in Smilo, we are really so happy that in the months to come, we are going to be able to offer you the vaccine that is going to be able to eventually allow you to start living life more normally again. And we know how important that is. Um, just a few really big picture points. I don't have slides, but I've seen questions um, from our patients coming in and I, there's some things I just wanna be able to tell you. So the clinical trials that were done that brought these vaccines to market that proved they were safe were done in healthy individuals, not in patients with cancer. So when we had to set about making guidelines and recommendations for the vaccine, we really had to base those guidelines on our knowledge of immunology and of, on our knowledge of cancer biology. So again, not really based on the patients we saw in the trials, but it's really important. And I want every one of you to realize this. There is absolutely no reason to believe that the vaccine will put you at any higher risk than anyone else. So we believe fully that this vaccine should be incredibly safe in cancer patients. Furthermore, we know that patients with active cancer, with different kinds of cancer, blood cancers and solid tumors, may be more vulnerable to the risks of getting a COVID-19 infection. And so for patients who have active cancer and on active cancer treatment, it's that much more important that you get the vaccine and the protection that the vaccine will give you. Um, there's some other questions that continue to come up. What about my family and will my family members be able to get vaccinated? So the guidelines that we developed in this um, <clears throat> NCCN committee that was working, we really would love to see household contacts and family members getting vaccinated because they put our patients at the highest risk for infection just by living in close proximity. But because the vaccine has still been in such limited supply, the current guidelines say that your family members should get vaccinated with the group in which they fall in terms of age and medical risk. But we do hope and endorse that this may change over time. Um, the real concern is not that the vaccine could cause you harm, but that if you're on certain kinds of cancer treatment, you may not amount as robust and immune response as somebody who's not on cancer treatment. And so it's going to be really important that you communicate with your treating doctor, your hematologist, your oncologist, your surgical oncologist, your GYN oncologist about the timing of your vaccine. So, so there are, for most patients who are on our standard cancer treatments, we absolutely believe you should get the vaccine and just have a conversation with your provider about when in your treatment cycle might be the best time for you to get that vaccine. There are select and small numbers of patients who have been so severely immunocompromised from their treatments, like patients who've had a very recent bone marrow transplant or CAR T cell procedure, somewhat maybe patients who are on chronic use of drugs like rituxan and IVIG that we don't know how brisk an immune response they'll make, um, but we want you to talk to your doctor about when the best time for you to get that vaccine is because we, we again, we want all of our patients to get that vaccine and the protection it brings. So those are my big picture comments. And then as more specific questions come in about different scenarios, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. 
Karen, thank you. Let me just, uh, uh, there's one question that uh, keeps coming in that I wanted to, you've kind of alluded to it, but it amounts to um, people who are on active therapy, should they hold their therapy so that they can get the vaccine? Yeah, so most likely the answer to that is no. Um, we want you to continue your, your treatment and we want you to get vaccinated but there are so many different treatments and so many different regimens that we do want you to talk to your doctor and decide you know, when in your treatment regimen or your treatment cycle would be the time in which you would be most likely to mount a good immune response. And that would most likely be you know, um, not the time in your treatment where your white blood cells go, go the lowest. But again, talk to your doctor and they will absolutely work with you to plan the timing. And then Karen, another question before we turn to Tara Samp is uh, a number of questions that relate to should patients with cancer, would it be better? Is there a particular version of the vaccine, be it Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, maybe even AstraZeneca, were that to be approved? Are any of them better than another for mm -hmm. a cancer patient? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So interestingly, the two approved vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer, are mRNA vaccines, which actually got their start in cancer treatment, is how these drugs were, this class of drugs was initially developed. So um, those two vaccines, the approved ones, are almost like fraternal twins, equally effective, have similar side effects, um, and both require two doses. So there's no reason to prioritize one over another. The best one for you is the one that is available on the day that you can get it. Um, the future vaccines to come, I wouldn't venture to make a recommendation until we see how effective they are. You know, there's a high bar now with vaccines that are 94, 95% effective. Thank you, Karen. Um, and now turning to our last speaker, I think for those of you who have been on several of these forums, one, we always want to take time out during the forums to address uh, supportive care and wellness because it's hard enough having cancer or having to care for family members with cancer. And uh, this has been a particularly difficult year. And uh, Dr. Tara Samp, who is our chief patient experience officer, as I know, been working with our teams, our patients, families, to try to ensure that we have everything we can in place to help people through this. And Tara, thank you for, uh, for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Charlie, and thanks everyone. Um, this has been a great discussion. And I know that um, I could listen to Karen Adelson talk all night about uh, cancer patients and vaccines. And I know you were just recently interviewed on our um, podcast, Yale Cancer Center Answers. And so for people who wanna hear more um, I would encourage them to, to find that podcast um, wherever you listen to podcasts. And Renee can correct me um, if I'm saying the wrong information. Uh, I do have one slide to share. And, um, you know, I just, I do think that it's important to echo that while we get um, our vaccines um, and, and the operations and, and all of our patients vaccinated, we need to continue to support each other. Um, and this is a very um, isolating time for many of us. Uh, if you're feeling particularly isolated or depressed, you know, we want you to reach out immediately. Uh, when I was asked to present tonight, I reached out to my colleagues who are in social work, integrative medicine, palliative care, and they all volunteered to come here tonight too. We are eager to help. Um, it's a privilege to be with you um, at this time. And, and we have many, many offerings um, that you can choose from. These are just a few websites um, that are, will link you through to different support groups. Uh, we have, I think about 20 support groups that we offer and the, the website um, lists all of them. You can choose as appropriate for you in your setting. Uh, integrative medicine, you know, um, focuses on um, Dr. Sofer says all the things that, that we had before medicine. So um, the healthy things that we know work for diet and exercise and sleep. And they have a number of offerings and a really lovely website. And then um, we have teamed up, uh, the survivorship clinic has teamed up with integrative medicine to also offer a supplements clinic. 
The palliative care services um, are located inpatient and outpatient, as well as um, the survivorship services, which are mostly outpatient, but we all do in-person and virtual visits. Uh, we think of ourselves as an extra layer of support, no matter what setting uh, you're in or what your issues are. And this is just a, a quick visual of the integrative medicine website. Um, and you can see here that they have links to many different offerings. And, and I, again, I don't wanna take up too much time, but um, let's stay connected. Uh, we're all one big community and no matter what, we're here for you. Uh, all along. So it's been a privilege to be with you tonight too, and I'll stop sharing now. Tara, thank you. Uh, and um, a number of questions that relate to the work you do uh, before I open it up to the general panel. Um, and, and thank you for sharing all those programs and, and making them available to our patients. But independent of the programs, you know, what advice would you give patients and families during these challenging times to just you know, stay emotionally well in what is a profound challenge? Uh, well, you know, I think, um, I wish I had the magic words to make everybody um, feel good, but I do think um, something that comes to mind to me often is loving kindness. And it's a, a meditation practice that basically allows you to be kind to yourself and kind to others and, and be patient and gentle. Um, this is unprecedented times. We're all doing the best we can do. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that we can feel that towards ourselves, that, that kindness and, um, and some patience as we, as we wait for this terrible pandemic to become better controlled. Um, and then, you know, of course, staying connected, I think, as a community has so many benefits, um, not just to getting through the pandemic, but to getting through cancer care in general. And um, it really is a privilege for all of us to be a part of your team. And so I, I hope that you can feel that and, and um, reach out to us and take advantage of our support. Tara, thank you. So let me now open it up to questions. And I just wanna say up front, we, we received about 70 questions online. And prior to the uh, forum, we received somewhere in the vicinity of about 50 a submitted advance. And I just want to say that uh, obviously we, we want to address everyone's question. Um, there'll always be an opportunity to speak to your provider with questions. We're going to get to as many as we can. Many of them fall into similar categories. And obviously I think my colleagues will do their utmost to anticipate other questions. Let me start with some of the practical ones and, and I'll turn to you on first. Um, a number of questions that uh, relate to, uh, you know, well, specifically all in the theme of will, will Smilo or Yale New Haven Health contact me for my appointment when the vaccine is available? Um, or do I reach out to the health system or my doctor? How does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's something that we've been talking about a lot about. Uh, I think the, the answer will change depend once the inventory uh, increases. Right now, we are not calling individuals uh, in particular. What we are doing is that our practices have the ability to identify the patients who are, you know, within the, they, they can in, identify their patients who are currently 75 or over, um, and they can let them know about the fact that there is availability. We have sent out some MyChart messages to uh, patients who are 75 and over, uh, indicating that this, this is now available and uh, guiding them to the website. As we get forward, I think we are, I, I would hope to use some of our registries to, uh, to enable people to be identified and, uh, and you know, be, receive a message of some sort. Um, but currently we are not calling patients to schedule. Um, right now it is, it's more of a self-scheduling thing with uh, a layer of notification when the vaccine is available. Kim, was there anything you wanted to add to that uh, that question that came in? I think the only thing I, well, yes, I guess. <laughs> I think the only thing I would add is that we do have the, uh, you know, ability on our website, on the health system website to um, 
to sign up to receive in information um, when, when you're eligible to receive the vaccine. So you can do that right now. And then that's a way that if you go to the y, if the Yale New Haven Health System website, there is a place right there where you can sign up for that so that you will receive information as soon as it's available. That's great. And I, I guess we should, we should have our patients should download, if they can download my chart to their phones. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah, I think that'll make that'll make things easier uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, I will say that it's not absolutely mandatory that we, you know, the the self scheduling uh, interface is actually it's it's a web based thing, so it's not absolutely required. But if you do have my chart, it will make things a lot easier. Great, thank you, all. Uh, Kevin, Dr. Billingsley, uh, a number of questions in the chat, and I'll read one, but it's a theme. Uh, I, I've been super cautious throughout the pandemic. Haven't seen my family or friends since March. Following vaccinations, what would be the indicators needed before I might safely resume going out in public? Great question, and I think it's on all of our minds. Um, what we do know is that you will start to get some protection after the first dose, and I'm talking about you know the 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 vaccines that we have most available at this time are the Moderna and the Pfizer, which are a two-dose program, one separated with a three-week interval, one by a four-week interval. Um, but you really need to get both doses. And what we know from the trials is the, the real full level of protection will not be for about a week to 10 days after the second dose. Now, that being said, we are reminding people that although that you should be protected, you should continue to use precautions, continue to wear your mask, continue to be safe. Um, but yes, at that point, you should have some in, immunologic protection. Thank you. Um, Alm, uh, a number of questions, and I think related to a question I'd asked Karen before, when they come, uh, do they get to choose, uh, let's say three or four are approved, do they get to choose which one they get? Yeah, so the, uh, the short answer is no, and here's why. Number one, that you know, as, as Kevin just mentioned, the two vaccines we currently have are both mRNA vaccines. They both have efficacy rates of 94, 95%, essentially equivalent. Uh, we at the health system have declared them therapeutically equivalent, and so has the state, and so so has the country. So uh, we receive. We don't know exactly which vaccine we receive, as I mentioned, on, as uh, I illustrated on the chart before. We've we've been giving both, and uh, so there's the what we have is is what we give. Um, you know, there there's been a lot of concerns. Earlier data indicated or seemed to su suggest that. The Moderna vaccine was associated with more frequent uh, side effects. Uh, the subsequent data that, that seems to be that, that came out illustrated that the actual frequency of side effects is about the same between the Pfizer and Moderna, but the specific side effects are a, a little bit different. With Moderna, you get a little bit of uh, swelling under the armpit on the, on the side that you get uh, injected on. With Pfizer, there's a slightly higher rate of fever. Um, both have muscle aches and joint aches, so it's you know, there's a little, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, the side effects are just sort of an inconvenience. They only last for a couple of days um, and really have no material difference. So there's no different, there's no ability to choose between the mRNA vaccines. Now, as we get more vaccines, um, you know, if we have more available, you know, for, for some reason, there may be a reason to choose one, one between the other convenience, you know, if you're leaving somewhere or there's a, you know, there's difference between one, a one dose vaccine versus a two dose vaccine. These are things that may make that choice a little bit more important. But uh, in general, I think the answer is going to be you're not going to have a choice just based on uh, the, how this is being distributed. Thank you. Karen, is there any cancer treatment or can type of cancer such that somebody should avoid getting the vaccine? So patients within three months of a bone marrow transplant that has completely um, depleted the bone marrow of all immune cells are really not likely to get any benefit from the vaccine. 
So generally our guidelines recommend waiting until you're three months out from your transplant, similarly potentially with CAR T cell treatments. And then there's some other treatments that are not an absolute contraindication to responding to the vaccine, but that may um, at least slow your immune response or may make the vaccine less effective. Those are people who are on high dose steroids for long periods of time. Patients who are on the drug rituximab may have a, what we would call a blunted immune response and maybe patients who receive IVIG therapy. But I would say don't rule yourself out under any circumstances, just bring your specific questions to your treating hematologist and oncologist and they will work with you to figure out the very best time for you to get the vaccine. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Tara, I, I neglected in my introduction to point out that not only are you the chief patient experience officer, you also lead the survivorship clinic. And there actually are a number of questions related to that. Namely, um, should patients who have com who completed their cancer treatment some time ago, are they considered different or a different risk related to those in active therapy? And will they also be prioritized for the vaccine? Um, yeah, that's a question I answer or try to answer 20 times a day. Um, and you know the good news is that patients who are uh, long-term survivors or outside of active treatment and on surveillance, you know, tend to have a mostly recovered immune system, and so their risk doesn't seem to be um, as high as other cancer patients who are on treatment. Um, and you know, in terms of prioritization, I guess I'm going to have to defer that to Karen. Um, you know, you're our patients, but I do think that um, we're going to have to wait and see what the guidance is uh, on that. Yeah, I think, you know, the beauty of surviving cancer is that you're probably not at especially high risk. So there's there's a good side to that. Um, and and you're, you will end up falling into the category that you fall into based on your other medical problems. So if you have heart disease or lung disease, you may be considered in the category of somebody who has a comorbidity that would bring you um, to an earlier vaccine than a healthy individual who doesn't. So again, you know, you're probably gonna need to talk about your specific situation with your individual doctor at the point in which vaccines are being rolled out to people with comorbidities. I would say if you're a survivor but has long-term complications of your cancer treatment, something like graft versus host disease or pulmonary fibrosis, that alone would bring you to a higher priority list. Well, Tara and Karen, thank you. Kim, uh, a number of questions which I know you field regularly regarding visitors, um, both inpatient and outpatient at Smilo. Um, you know, where are we at now? Um, what do you sort of see the likelihood for change in that? Uh, obviously, that's, it's difficult for families and patients. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Hey, thanks, Charlie. Right now, we are at a place where we're continuing all of our visitor restrictions for all the things we talked, for all the reasons we talked about earlier. We're just not at a place where we could start to um, allow more visitation. I think Kevin talked earlier about how we know how hard it is for our patients, whether they're in the hospital or coming into our clinics or radiation therapy centers or our infusion centers. Um, we know how hard it is to come in alone. We do have exceptions um, that, you know, uh, obviously um, that, that if it's absolutely needed for a visitor to come in, there are certain exceptions that we have, especially for those patients that unfortunately are, are nearing the end of their life and having a family member there with them. Um, but it really to safeguard the safety of all of our community, all of our patients, their loved ones and our staff, we still have the same visitor restrictions that we've had for several months now. Um, and we do uh, those pre-screening phone calls um, still as well. But as Kevin mentioned, we really want to utilize our technology. So we really want you to feel free to, um, you know, during your clinic visit, you can say, wait a minute, I really want to get my 
um, husband, wife, my best friend on the phone here, I really think somebody needs to listen to this with me. Um, you can FaceTime them. Uh, we, if you don't have the technology, we have technology to help you. Um, so please, uh, if we haven't offered it to you, please feel free to stop us and, and tell us that you need um, to get somebody on the line. If, if you need uh, your family to hear, to be there with you, even if it's uh, through the phone or uh, virtually uh, through, through FaceTime or Zoom. So we are, we are here to make sure that we do everything we can to accommodate um, having, having your, your support um, near you, even if it's not how we have traditionally had it. But as soon as we can safely um, have you have your support with you, um, we will be welcoming um, your friends and families with open arms. And um, it's a big part of how we deliver cancer care. So, um, you know, we want to bring it back as soon and as, as we can, um, but it needs to be safe. Kevin, I don't know if there's anything more you want to say about that. No, I completely agree with all of those comments. Thank you both. Oh, uh, some questions. What does ninety-five percent protection mean? Is that and and a related point is does that mean I have a five percent chance of getting the infection if I get vaccinated? Uh, yeah, that's the question. So. Uh, there's a slight difference between efficacy and effectiveness, uh, but yeah. The, the 95% rate number is, essentially means one out of 20 individuals uh, may not mount the immunity that's sufficient to prevent COVID-19 illness. So yes, uh, that said, it's uh, as you mentioned earlier, Charlie, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly unbelievably effect, uh, high and uh, encouraging number. Uh, most vaccines do not have those kinds of performances. So these are these are really special and exceptional vaccines that we are lucky to have. And can I say something about herd immunity? Just so, so related to what Ohm said is that if enough people in the population have that 95% immunity, the chances that one person who's infected would bump into another person who doesn't have immunity goes way down. And so the 95% um, vaccination rate or immunity rate should really end up protecting the whole population. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, are there certain medications that one should or should not take when they get the vaccine and or should they avoid shortly after getting the vaccine? And I think they're probably referring to like a Motrin, Tylenol. I mean, I, that seems to be many of the questions. And obviously others can chime in as well, but it's, it, we've gotten a lot of questions on that. Well, I, I actually may punt that one to Karen. I'm going to say, in my view, um, I, I don't think this has been well studied. I think Motrin and Tylenol are fine and will provide symptomatic relief for people who have low grade fever and symptoms after vaccination, but Karen, why don't or um, why don't you guys chime in as well? The I think the package insert that you get says you can take either, um, and and you should you know treat your symptoms and not not suffer stoically. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think uh, I might even go a little further and say you know the, maybe the the night you go to sleep after getting the vaccine, it may just make things a little easier to take something. Um, you know these so. I know I, I, we, I called these uh, side effects an inconvenience, but they are real. And you know, they, they may keep people out, out of work. You feel pretty bad for a little bit. Um, and it is a little bit, it's two days, it's three days. It's not gonna be more than that. Um, but in the meantime, you know, it, it, it would make your life a little easier to take a little Tylenol and ibuprofen, as long as it's safe for you to do so. You don't have you know, renal issues or, or liver issues that, that would prevent you from taking them. I, I would think that, you know, make it a little easier on yourself. Thank you. Thank you both, all three of you. Um, Tara, um, a number of questions. You know, obviously there has been some controversy about vaccinations in general in, in the, let us say, social media. Um, should our patients in Smilo be worried about people who go online suggesting that vaccines are bad? 
Mm, well, um, you know, I think that we have to be very careful with where we get our information. And in general, social media probably isn't um, the most reliable source because people can post things that um, are actually not news, um, that they're, they're not real. So um, I think, you know, this is a great forum that we're disseminating information tonight. We have a, a website dedicated to COVID resources for patients. And, um, and I would suggest that, um, as it's been said multiple times, that patients ask their providers, you know, to clarify any questions. So we here at Smilo firmly believe in the power of medicine and science and vaccines, and we encourage all of our patients to take them. And, and I hope that all of our patients feel comfortable, you know, bringing questions or if they see something that seems legitimate on social media, bring that to us and we can discuss it. Sure, thank you. And by the way, uh, one of our one of our attendees thought thinks your child is adorable. And I, it's I would, uh, getting beyond her bedtime, and so you're hearing her now in the background. <laughs> well, I would concur. Um, there's um, a question, uh, and actually, I think it's a, a very good point. It's a question and a comment, which is, you know, please make sure that people understand that this is free of charge, so they don't get scammed. People might take advantage and call you to say uh, you can get the vaccine if you pay for it. Do you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yes, thank you for that question, Charlie. You're right. It's, it's a very important question. Uh, so at all of our vaccination sites, we uh, there's the, let me start by saying you, there should be at no point should you have to reach into your own pocket and, 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 and hand over any money uh, for this vaccine. Uh, we are, what we're doing is we will, for, the, for individuals who do have insurance, we are billing insurance for a small administration fee, and that is how the federal government has set up the uh, payment to cover some of the costs associated with vaccination. So we will bill insurance. We will not, there are no copays. There's nothing out of pocket. And if individuals do not have insurance, they will not be charged at all. So it will be, you should at no point have to pay anything for this vaccine. So if someone tells you otherwise, uh, walk in the other direction. Thank you. Um, Kevin, uh, Dr. Billingsley, um, for patients who are being scheduled for cancer surgeries or procedures, should they postpone until they get vaccinated and or will they get vaccinated before their procedure because they're getting a procedure? Unfortunately, I don't think that a scheduled procedure is necessarily going to accelerate the vaccination process. You know, as we've talked about, so much of this is um, uh, just a product availability issue. Um, ultimately, I think it is really important to proceed with scheduled or planned cancer surgery. I think the, the potential or, and real risks of delaying surgical therapy for cancer far outweighs the risks. And this speaks to the point that, you know, I think both Kim and I made earlier that we really continue to exercise extraordinarily vigilant efforts to main, sa maintain safety in the operating room and in the in the hospital for patients who are getting getting care here. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I, and I'll turn uh, this one. I'll offer up to any of our panelists. There's been a number of questions regarding the anecdotes, news about allergic reactions um, that have been, you know promulgated because of the limited number of reactions that have occurred. Um, one is, what do we know about that? Should that be a concern for patients? Any of our panelists want to take that one? Uh, I, might, I might take a crack and Karen, you can add. Um, so number one, uh, people with histories of allergies are not prevented from getting these vaccines. So what if you've had a severe allergic reaction to things like penicillin or something else, you, what we do is uh, you will wait a little longer after you get the vaccine to be observed to make sure that nothing is happening. Uh, there is there's no allergic reaction that prevents you from getting uh, from getting the vaccine. Uh, all of our vaccination sites are equipped with people who can respond to any sort of uh, emergency. Uh, we have the meds there, uh, so there's you know there's really no contraindication. Karen, I don't know. Great. So thank you. So the rates are really, really low. 
of severe allergic reactions. So you may hear about it in the news, but given the massive numbers of people being vaccinated, the chance of you having an allergic reaction is tiny. Um, for patients who do have a real allergic reaction, and again, it's extremely rare to the first dose, we would probably have you see one of our immunologists before getting the second dose and would give you the second dose in a controlled environment, um, just to make sure that we have everything around you to keep you safe. Great, thank you. Uh, another- uh, I'll just add, the number, the number of people who've actually had allergic reactions here uh, that, that we know is, is true anaphylaxis is one. We've had a, a, a few others with questionable allergic reactions, but true anaphylaxis, there has been one person out of the 40,000 people that we have vaccinated. So that just you know goes to Karen's point that it is very, 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 very rare. Thank you both. Um, uh, because the Johnson Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccines are a virus, should cancer patients avoid that particular version of the vaccine? Uh, I think probably the answer in general is, uh, you know what, I'm going to defer to the oncologist here. I'm, gonna, I'm a simple sure. internist. Well, I can, so I can take gonna... that one. So you, it's, Please. you know, it is a virus, but it's, not, it's a virus that is not harmful to humans and it is incapable of multiplying or replicating. It's, it's actually essentially a dead virus. It's not, it doesn't have the ability to do what viruses don't because they've taken that part of the genes out of the virus. So really all it is, it's just a vehicle to put the gene, the, the, the one gene for COVID to generate the immune response. So it's not, a, people, you know, people may have heard that if you're getting cancer therapy, don't get a live virus vaccine. This is not, the Johnson Johnson AstraZeneca are not live viruses. They're essentially dead viruses because they can't replicate. They can't multiply in your body. So if you get, if you go, well, firstly, neither of those vaccines are approved, but if they are, and you go to the one of our offices and you're offered the Johnson & Johnson, that's fine. Um, obviously, but first we wanna see the results. We'll get them in February. But at the moment, if you were to get vaccinated, unless things change, it will only be the RNA viruses, which are not viruses and uh, vaccines. It'll only be the RNA vaccine rather. And that's Moderna and Pfizer. So let me just say it's it's 8:15, and uh, I think Tara's kids need to go to bed, and probably all of us need to uh, get some rest for tomorrow. Um, I want to really thank uh, our panelists: Kevin Billingsley, Om Despondi, Kim Slusser, Karen Adelson, Tara Sam. Uh, I also want to thank Eliza Folsom and Renee Gaudet for pulling this together. I noticed that we almost, I think we had up to about 600 people on the, uh, on the system here. And that does include people who were probably watching through alternative things online. So really an extraordinary turnout. Obviously this is of great interest. So I just wanna say, uh, Dr. Charles Fuchs, uh, Cancer Center Director and Physician Chief, wanna thank all of you for attending. Um, we uh, really appreciate your courage through all of this. And you know you have you should know we're here for you, um, and we're always available. We didn't get to every question, but you can always reach out to us with your questions. Um, you're important, and we are going to make sure that we all get through this pandemic, uh, get vaccinated, and move on with our lives. So uh, for now.